Lord. And for that part of all, we say thank you. Thank you, Father God. We can't thank you enough, oh God, for what you are doing for us, what you have done for us, what you are about to do for us. In the mighty name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, lift your hands and go into that secret place. Let God know how much you love him. Let him know how much you appreciate him. Let him know how much you adore him because nobody but him can do it. In the name of Jesus. If you came in this place right now, if your heart is heavy, all you need to do is call on the name of Jesus, and he will heal your heart. He will comfort you. He will send you peace, whatever it is, in the name of Jesus. So Holy Spirit, have your way in this service, oh God. Do what you want to do, Holy Spirit. As we partner with you, Father God, move by your spirit, Holy Ghost. In the name of Jesus, Lord, we thank you for your angels, oh God, that kept us and keeping us right now. Father God, move through the praise team, oh God, as they lift up your name and praise, oh God, to sing to you, Heavenly Father. Move through the musicians, oh God, touch them and anoint them right now in the mighty name of Jesus. Father God, let your anointing be felt right now. When they walk into the sanctuary, let's shift the atmosphere, put your hands together. Today, move by your spirit, speak through him, and we will be forever changed. Oh God, yes, God, and we just believe you right now. We receive impartation right now in the mighty name of Jesus, and it is so in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Glory, hallelujah. Come on, how many know he deserves all the glory and all the praise? Come on, it belongs to him. So we just want to take this opportunity just to magnify him. For all the glory and all the praise it belongs to him. Hallelujah. My hallelujah belongs to you. Come on, somebody say. My hallelujah belongs to
exalted. Come on, he is worthy to be glorified in this place. He deserves all the praise, all the honor. It belongs to him.
Amen. Welcome you, amen, to uh, this casual women's Sunday, amen. I know some of you like, oh, he got on tennis shoes, amen. Now nah, it's all good, amen. We came to worship the Lord, amen. So if this is your first time, amen, to Mount Zion and Church, if you would just raise your hand in the air real high for me. We just want to acknowledge you and welcome you. Come on, Mount Zion, let's welcome you. organization. You hear more about it through her. She's um, organizing and raising funds to extirpate breast cancer, especially through early interventions like mammograms and things like that. So with no further ado, Angelique, come on up. With thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Yeah. Seven, and the peace of God, which suppresses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Yeah. Now, this is very important to me, and I feel like this should be uh, a very important instruction to you guys. Because um, in this world, with all this chaos, we think about our past. Yeah. We uh, think so far in the present, and we get anxious, and that's where the uh, depression comes and all these other things that comes that um, just try to weigh you down, try to put weights on you. But God said be anxious for nothing. Amen. So it's our job to be present and take it one day at a time yeah. and understand that with everything that go on, that we walk by faith and not by sight. Yeah. So that means as we take our step, be, be, um, just be confident that God is gonna unfold the next instruction. Yeah. See, a lot of things I've done, I had no idea how I was gonna do it. I had doubters, I had naysayers, but I took that step of faith because I know what my God said, yeah. and through that, so many great things, and I don't mean to cry, but so many great things have happened. Amen. So I want to leave you with that word of encouragement to stand for that word. Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And another verse came to me as well. It says, Yea, do I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Yes. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Yes. Just hold on to God's unchanging yes. hand. Yes. When you're going through it, just hold on. Don't let go. Amen. 
We're gonna have um, video announcements at this time, and then after the video announcements, we'll have a beautiful testimony by Mercedes. She'll come up right after the video announcements. Thank you. You can join us live on Facebook every Monday at 12 p.m. Also, we have prayer in the evening on Mondays and Wednesdays from 545 to 615. Join us for our breakthrough prayer. Bandit Brothers Men's Ministry is focused on building men and building lives. Men, join us every fourth Saturday of the month as we engage, empower, and encourage one another. See you there. Hi, I'm Sister Tony. I'm the Opportunity Leader of our Missions Department. Our Missions Department serves our community by providing free groceries to help meet the needs of people. We meet every fourth Friday from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. We can't wait to have you. The Sewing Ministry meets every third Saturday of the month. For more information, please see Sister Maria Ford. My name is Tina Simmons, and I am a member of the Outreach Ministry. Our main purpose is to win the loss at any cost. For more information, see Brother Calvin Simmons. A good understanding of the Bible leads to a closer relationship with Jesus Christ, which leads to making better choices, leading to better behavior. If you want to help change lives, then see Brother Ray today. We believe that you will have a positive impact on their neighborhoods, schools, communities, and families when they have a better understanding of who they are and who God has created them to be. Junior high and high school students are welcome. Elevate your look. Are you dating but still not married? Are you looking for your future spouse? Or maybe you desire a godly group of friends while you're enjoying your single life. Mount Zion Single Ministry meets every third Saturday from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Being single doesn't mean you have to be alone. Mount Zion's Marriage 101 classes are held every second Saturday evening at 6 p.m. in the zone. We have a great time breaking bread, studying God's word, and other books from biblical scholars to understand God's true intent for marriage. We also have outings and events that we know you would love to participate in. You can email us at marriage101 at gmail.com for more information. Looking to better your marriage? Join us. Our Women's Worship and Health Service is Sunday, June 26th for our Women's Service. Our special guest will be Dr. Christopher Perkins. Learn more about breast cancer awareness and other issues affecting women's health. For all children in the first grade all the way up to the eighth grade, we have Vacation Bible School on Monday, July 25th through Friday, July 30th. And on Saturday, July 31st, we will conclude with a church-wide picnic. Our youth revival will be this summer in August. Stay tuned for more information. Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning, family. Good morning. Can I tell I'm nervous? <laughs> oh, I think we're honored to some first lady. I love you guys so much. Congratulations, Tati. Yeah. Well, you in here somewhere. Congratulations. Did you guys know she's Miss Black Fresno? Woo! Yeah. I'm going to give a testimony this morning, and I would like to read to you um, Proverbs 16 and 3. And it says, commit to the Lord whatever you do, and he will establish your plans. <clears throat> and I don't know if you guys know, but I do residential cleaning here and there. Um, office cleaning and I the Lord has said it on my heart um, during COVID to do cleaning for um, an older couple and just to be a blessing to them and so I was doing it consistently and I had a leg injury <clears throat> and I couldn't move how I was moving and so I I kind of was frustrated I was frustrated because I, I'm so used to being independent and moving and going how I wanted to. And so God slowed me down and he reminded me that no matter it, the position you're in, the situation you're in, I'm going to take care of you. 
And so doing that work, doing COVID, being consistent with them, <clears throat> they called me to do some C <laughs> CNA, excuse me, CNA work for them. And it was a blessing the way God worked it out because I didn't know what I was going to do. And I was like, I'm just going to get me this kind of job. And it wasn't in my lane. And I was frustrated. And I was just trying to do any old thing to, you know, provide because you want to provide for your family. And so God was like, they called me and they wanted me to come help them and do different kind of work. And I was so grateful because I'm able to do something and to spend time with them and receive and get wisdom from them yeah. is a blessing because I would get that for free because of my heart and God bless me and I can oh, it gave me opportunity for me and my daughter um, to do some, get paid for something that I would do for free Amen. and so commit your ways commit to the Lord and he will establish your plan and I was, you gotta trust God in every every way with your thoughts you know in your business plan and everything because I didn't know that doing something, you know, in that season, being consistent was going to pay off in this season. And so Amen. it's truly a blessing. And Amen. thank you, guys. Amen. 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 Thank you, Mercedes, for that beautiful testimony. And I, I am on, on one of the auxiliary groups here at Mount Zion. It's a senior ministry. And Mercedes joined with the senior ministry. And just to watch her interact with the seniors, yeah, I've watched her. And it's just the compassion that she had in her heart for the seniors. It's a blessing. So thank you for that. Amen. Next on our list, Kishana. Um, we're going to do offering at this time. Amen. So bring your blessings to the Lord, and Amen. you will be blessed a hundredfold. Amen. 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 What a blessing. And just as she was sharing about giving and how her, she was blessed by giving to the seniors, we all know that we are blessed when we sow. Amen? Amen. So I'm going to read a quick scripture to you. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 and 7 says, But this I say, he that soweth sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he that soweth bountifully shall reap bountifully. Every man according as he has purpose in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves cheerful givers. How many cheerful givers do we have today? And God is able to make all grace abound to you. So when you're a cheerful giver, God will make grace abound to you that they may have all sufficiency in all things and you may abound in every good work. And so when we give to the Lord, God will make that increase uh, provide for you. Amen. It's not just, oh, I'm just giving to this church. No, when you sow, you're sowing unto the Lord and God will open up doors for you. God will cause provision to come into your family so that you won't lack. And so I just want to encourage you to give your tithes today. We know that's a tenth of your income. Give an offering. It's what we offer to God. And we're giving um, cheerfully today because we know God is going to provide for us. Amen. Amen. So our ushers, they have envelopes they're passing right now. There's three different ways you can give. Say you don't have cash, you can text to give. You can text give to 833-668-2664. You see it right there on the screen. You can um, do cash app. Cash app to dollar sign MTZ now, or you can mail those gifts in for those that are watching us online. And I know you see it on your screen there. So when you're ready with your offering, what we do is we come up to the altar and you can put it in the buckets or put it on the steps. And uh, we're going to say a prayer at the end. Amen. You may come when you're ready.
envelope in the air. Our ushers will be happy to grab that. Just wave it in the air. Now with hands of faith, stretch to the altar. Lord, we thank you for every cheerful giver today, Lord God. We thank you, Father, that your word promised that you would rebuke the devourer for our sake. And we thank you, Father God, that our finances are covered by your power and your grace. And that you will bring increase as you promised, Lord God. We thank you, Father, for abundance. We thank you for every need being met, Lord God. We even thank you, Father God, for prodigal children coming back home. We thank you for reconciliation, Lord God. We thank you, Father, that every need mentally, physically, emotionally is met by the power of your blood, Lord God. We love you and we give you praise and we worship you in advance for how you're going to provide for us. Now everyone say see, go, go. Grow. grow, harvest. harvest. We'll see you real soon. In Jesus name. Amen.
so he can introduce Dr. Perkins. Um, I've worked with him for many, many years at the Infusion Center. He is working with Dr. Perkins. He's the director of clinical research nursing. He has a big, long title. You, so. you forgot that I was your old boss, too, remember? Oh, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember. Yeah. But I just wanted to acknowledge this one. No. Oh. <laughs> I love Michael. Thank you, Lord. Research Network Koji. It's a specialty um, research uh, network dedicated especially for uh, women with uh, breast and gynecological cancers. Um, we uh, are a set up shop in uh, women's cancer care, which is a the same women's breast and gynecological cancer center here in Fresno. Uh, the only one between, uh, I think, Bakersfield and San Francisco. Um, I originally came from another facility in, in town and uh, I've been a hemonc nurse for many years and I've been in clinical research for about five or seven years. And uh, Dr. Perkins had uh, talked to his staff one day at work and said, hey, you know, I want to do some clinical trials here in this office. Who do we call and, and talk to to get, to get this going? And uh, I'm just going to throw out a name. Crystal said, you need to call Michael Mott. <laughs> so, he reached out to me and you know, I really wasn't looking for a, a job. I had a job, I thought I was gonna retire there for a while. But you know, um, it's been a blessing that we've um, come together. We have kind of the same ideas of uh, getting things going. Uh, we're picking uh, trials that are, um, you know, prescription follies in, in, the, in the doctor's tool belt. You know, women that are running out of options and. We're finding clinical trials to put these women on these trials of opportunities that they normally wouldn't have. And, uh, you know, I've been blessed uh, since I came into his office, and uh, I, I hope he's blessed too. And uh, <laughs> this is a good guy. I'm gonna bring up Dr. Christopher Perkins. Thank you, Michael. Um, firstly, I'm honored to be, honored to be here. Um, secondly, I think there is more talent on this stage than there is in Hollywood. Uh, <laughs> thirdly, um, I don't know what you'd probably say, a dedicated Catholic. And when we sing, we sing songs that were written in the 1700s by a constipated guy from England. You know, it doesn't have this. Even Mike Mott said, we need to have this group at our church. You know, because it, it oh, just adds so much. But 
Thank you very, very much. Again, it's an honor to be here, and thank you for the invitation. I love that shirt. Oh, it says, love changes everything. Yeah. It's very, very true. I think everybody in the country should wear a shirt like that. Yeah. So today is Women's Day. And I say, bah humbug. <laughs> Every day should be Women's Day. Yeah. You know, because women are the core of society. That, you know, I've done nonprofit work in third world countries, and I've said to myself that a third world country could never evolve into a first world country without women. Because women always make decisions of what's best for society, what's best for their children, what's best for their family, and men make decisions sometimes what's best for their egos or, excuse me, certain body parts. So, women shouldn't have a day, they should have a year. So I'm here to talk about breast cancer, and let me give you a little bit of history. Um, I've taken care of women all my life. Uh, my mother had health issues. I was an only child. Uh, my mom was unwed, and I took care of her as far back as I can remember until she died. Um, I think that's what propelled me into wanting to be a breast cancer specialist. For years, I was a general oncologist, and the man came knocking on my door and said, here's where I want you to go, and that's where I went. So let's talk about what cancer is first before we talk about breast cancer. So we all have heard about cancer, what is it? So I thought about this analogy driving here today, and you know when God and the Holy Spirit got together and they said, you know, we've created Earth, now we need to put human beings there. But you know, if we allow them to reproduce and reproduce and reproduce, and they never die, then we'll have an overpopulated Earth and they'll destroy everything faster than we're probably destroying. So, evolved cancer. And what cancer is, is that in your body, cells reproduce all the time. So when you cut yourself, you know, the wound heals up and it doesn't even look like you cut yourself. Well, that goes on internally. All your organs, your breast cancer, your breast tissue, intestines, lung. So these cells die off and they're reproduced by new cells. We call that cell division. And the way I could best for you best to think about it is that the cell is like a auto, like a Tesla factory. Those cars are going down the production line and everything is hunky-dory. Every once in a while a car gets pulled off because they miss quality assurance, but the cell and that production line continue to work. What happens in a cancer cell is that that production line, the car goes veering off the production line, halts the production line, screws everything up, and they have to close the factory. Well, in cancer what happens is that instead of closing the factory, that factory continues to make bad cars. And that's what cancer is. It starts to reproduce. These cells that are bad cells start to reproduce and reproduce. So let's talk specifically about breast cancer. So to understand breast cancer, it's important to understand the anatomy of the breast. You know, you have the lobule or the area that makes the milk. You have the duct that brings the, nip, the milk to the nipple. And I, for again, visualization, it's like a tree, that the branches of the tree are the lobules, the trunk of the tree is the duct, and it leads the milk to the nipple. And again, those cells are going through active proliferation or division. Well, for some reason, and we'll get into the causes in just a few minutes, that cell starts to go haywire and produces cancer. Just as lung cancer or any other cancer, the cell goes haywire and it reproduces, reproduces, until it's either picked up by mammogram, which hopefully it will be, because that means it's detected early, or it's picked up by palpation. So I'm gonna ask you, there's a, a kind of a mixture of people in the audience, who's over 40 in this, raise your hand. Who's over 40? Males excluded. <laughs> we're, not, you're not, we're not talking to you guys today anyway, it's Women's Day. Uh, raise your arm again, and, and your hands again. How many of you have had a mammogram within the last 12 months? So maybe 60%, 70%. And I realize COVID has kind of put a wrench into things. Um, and that's too bad because there's been data produced now indicating that 
because of COVID, women will present with more advanced cancers. Oh. So we need to pay attention to that. So let's talk about breast cancer in the black population, because that's why we're here. Not only talk about clinical trials, but what does it mean for the black population? Unfortunately, for whatever reason, and we'll get into those some of the reasons in a minute, African-American women have present with more aggressive breast cancer in more advanced stage. Why is that? The more aggressive cancer probably relates to genetics in some form or fashion. And the more advanced stage usually is multifactorial. Number one, genetics. And number two, access to care. And number three, the philosophy of the woman. And let me expand on that because that's not quite as evident. So women in general usually think about their kids first, the house second, and the husband third, maybe the second and third interchange, but they don't put themselves first. And until the woman in the healthcare arena puts themselves first, they will continue to present with more aggressive disease and more advanced disease. And so what I do is I petition the women who haven't had their marriage to put yourself first because you have to be here for those other two reasons yeah. the kids and the family yes. Amen. and if you don't put yourself first every once in a while and take care of your health care issues you're going to end up in my office losing your hair and not feeling great and we don't want that to happen because we understand the earlier breast cancer is caught the more curable it is so if a cancer is this big it's 100% curable if a cancer is this big, it's not. So you have to present early, and for you younger women, especially African American women, if they feel a lump, and you're under the age of 40, and you go to your primary care physician, and he says, oh, honey, don't worry about it, pats you on the back, and you leave, stop, and go see another doctor. Because you have to be proactive in your care. It's super important that you're proactive in your care. So when we have, when we see a breast cancer patient, we stage it, and all of you have heard staging of cancer. You know, the worst stage of it all is stage four disease, and that means it's gone to lung, liver, bone, or one of those other places. And stage one disease is where it's located to the breast, and stage two is where there's lymph node involvement, and stage three where there's even more lymph node involvement, and we wanna catch it at stage one. Stage one breast cancer is 95% curable. That's why you have to be proactive with your care. Yes. Let's cause, talk about causes of breast cancer. You know, for the most part, we don't know the cause of breast cancer. We just don't. And that seems weird. You know, if you're a cigarette smoker and you present with lung cancer, those are easy dots to connect. Cigarette smoke and lung cancer go hand in hand. But we do know that there are certain variables to the causation of breast cancer. Number one, obesity. And the reason why this occurs is that there is constant stimulation of, you've all heard of insulin before, insulin drives down blood sugars, where there's constant stimulation of these growth factors in patients who are overweight that cause breast cancer. So a word to the wise. Second, alcohol. And this is very interesting. We know that alcohol probably causes breaks in the DNA or the genes of the cell. And you don't want breaks in your DNA because that's what causes cancer. So alcohol. And third is tobacco use. And tobacco is a toxin. You know, we all know that. Not only is it that it contributes to the cause of, of uh, lung cancer, but breast cancer as well. We often talk about genes causing cancer, the BRCA gene. Well, you know, it's not that big a deal. It's only 4 to 6% of breast cancers have the BRCA gene. So everybody says, oh, my mom didn't have breast cancer, my grandmother didn't have breast cancer, so I won't develop breast cancer. That's hogwash. Yeah. Because only four to six percent of cancers are genetically related. So I don't, you cannot take comfort in just the fact that your mom didn't have breast cancer that you won't get it. Wow. All right, so, so how do we go about diagnosing breast cancer? The most easy, fundamental way of catching early breast cancer is mammography. And as much as the propaganda is out there that, oh, you don't need one, or you should get it every two years, most of that data, believe it or not, comes from Europe and have 
uh, they have uh, socialized medicine. Socialized medicine doesn't want to spend money, so they produce data that nobody believes. So over the age of 40, yearly mammograms needs to be done without any skipping. I, you know, COVID got in the way a little bit, but going forward, nothing should get in the way. And we do that to a certain age. So what age should you stop do, doing mammograms? It depends on your overall health. If you're 60 years old and on dialysis and have heart failure, and you have all these contributing factors to the, that will cause your death, you can probably stop. But if you're a healthy 80 year old lady, helping out, volunteering, doing your thing, you still need to get mammograms. The other way that we don't like to have the diagnosis is through palpation, if you feel the lump, because then it's a pretty good size. And there's been, again, that theory of don't do your self breast exams. You know, don't do it, it doesn't make any sense. And there's that school of thought. But I counter that for two reasons. Number one, you should do your breast exam because it's complementary to the mammogram, because in some women, their breasts are so dense that the mammogram is not that effective. And more importantly than that, by doing your self breast exam, if you're still having periods, five days after your periods, if you're not having periods any longer because you're postmenopausal, you can do it any time. By doing your breast exam empowers you to take care of yourself. Yeah. That every month, if you're postmenopausal, the first day of the month you're gonna do your breast exam, that means you're taking care of yourself. Yeah. That you're not you know, succumbing to the whims and wishes of your kids, the husband, your parents, the neighbor down the street, you're empowering yourself, and that's so important. So, there's also this stigma of, if I catch it early, I, you know, they're gonna remove my breast, or I'm gonna need treatment. But, oh, I'll put it on the back burner because it really doesn't matter. It does, because as, as I said earlier, the earlier you catch breast cancer, the more curable it, it is. If you catch it early, there's a good chance that you may not need chemotherapy. Yeah. But once it's caught, we approach breast cancer in two ways. What do we do locally to the breast? And then what do we give the patient? Might be chemotherapy, might be a hormone blocker pill to keep the disease from coming back somewhere else in your body. So the first question, majority of patients can have a lumpectomy if it's caught early enough. Well, oh, lumpectomy means that the breast is preserved, you can wear a low-cut evening dress and nobody's gonna stare at you wondering what happened to you. That's what we wanna catch. We wanna catch breast cancer at stage one. So a lumpectomy, if the cancer is too large, now what we're doing is giving chemotherapy before the lumpectomy to shrink it down so we can uh, do a lumpectomy instead of a mastectomy. Um, so it's just, again, I just want to emphasize, I know it's not like a broken record. You've got to empower yourselves to catch cancer early. It's the yeah. whole Because you don't want to get chemotherapy. Most of you, you ladies here have unbelievable hair and you don't want to lose it. You know? And as I said, black population has more aggressive disease and more aggressive disease usually means that you're going to get chemotherapy. If it's, if it's so large that it was picked up either by physical exam or just large. So be proactive with your health. The other thing that's important is follow up. You know, taking good care of yourself. There was a recent article published that looked at patients who had breast cancer, if they exercised, uh, had a low fat diet, which low fat for all of us has different definitions. <laughs> Maybe you mean skipping McDonald's one week or other, but low fat diet is less than 20% of your calories in fat. So there's tons of apps on nowadays that you can download and start inputting what you're eating and you'll be blown away by how much fat is in your diet. You'll say, I have to make a change here. So low fat diet is really important. Exercise, getting three hours of aerobic exercise a week. That means not taking the poodle out and the poodle peeing every five feet and you're walking really <laughs> slow. Aerobic means hopping and puffing, getting your, your heart rate up. And last but not least is low alcohol, no more than three, three drinks per week. So again, it's just getting involved in your care and being proactive with your care because don't we want to live a long time? Yes. You know? Don't we want to be here for our kids and grandkids this morning I woke up to my son holding my granddaughter 
I mean, those moments are incredible. Yeah. Yes. Just incredible. Yes. And for a guy that has heart disease and a guy that has cancer, I want to be around for a while. Yeah. Yes. So, you know, you have to be proactive with your care. Yes. Um, making changes in lifestyle is really tough. It is the toughest thing on the planet. Um, you know, I'll give a lady chemotherapy to reduce her risk of reoccurrence, say by four to six percent. So if you, you have this disease, I give you chemotherapy, I can reduce the risk of reoccurrence by four to six percent. She takes the chemotherapy. She loses her hair, she feels like crud for six months and goes on her merry way. So I'll, she comes back and I'll say, to reduce your risk of reoccurrence by 23%, 23%. Low fat diet, aerobic exercise, and low alcohol. Most of the time she tells me to go take a hike. You know, wow. she'll come back in, weigh in another 10 pounds on the next visit. So that's hard. You know, it's hard for us as the oncologist because, you know, I pour my heart and soul into my patients. Mm -hmm. And when there's not that collaboration, yes. it, it gets frustrating. Yeah. So you have to collaborate in your health because nobody else will. Mm -hmm. Your husbands don't, your kids won't, you know, your parents might you know, tell you, oh, you gotta do this, do that. But you have to be proactive, and you guys are the worst with being proactive with your own selves. So, um, we've come a long way, and we're going further with the cure of cancer. We've started Women's Cancer Research Network. We're the only women's cancer research network in the United States run by Mike Mott and his team, a phenomenal team of people. And we're passionate about coming up with better drugs to cure cancer. We have three trials open. We're gonna have several other trials opening up over the next few months to get closer to the cure. Yes. So I wanna throw out an idea to this audience. You, know, you have women that are engaged in breast cancer but, and through health organization within your, your church is to maybe have um, a women's health network where you start you know, making sure that each one of you over the age of 40 gets mammograms and calling each other up and say, hey Mary, did you get your mammogram? I was assigned to you this week by the pastor because he's concerned that you're not taking good care of yourself. So I, I would ask you to form maybe a women's health ministry yes. where it's a prevention ministry. Not once you have it, you go take care of them, you bring them food, but something, there's nothing better than peer pressure <laughs> to make you perform. Yes. So I would ask that you might want to consider doing that because it has to start at the grassroots. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It can't be Congress or the president telling us what to do because we never listen because we don't trust them. Um, <laughs> it has to be within our close organization. Mm -hmm. And so I, I would ask you to think about that. You know, the pastor and I were talking about what ministries he had before uh, the talk today, and you, know, you might want to consider doing such a thing. So, Amen. 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 Um, I like questions and answers, and I don't want you to be bashful. The pastor said, well, they might be bashful. I said, no way. <laughs> so I have to tell you this one thing. Uh, just uh, So I've always loved to sing, but I'm a white guy. White guys can't sing. I was at my, on my treadmill, uh, this is many years ago, in my house, and I, and I had Michael Jackson on my headphones, and I was singing at the top of my lungs. And my kids get out of the, come into the, get out of the car, come into the house, come running up to where the treadmill was, thinking somebody was murdering me. <laughs> so, anyway, questions. Why don't we do questions? Uh, there's a mic that will be passed around. Hi, good morning. Um, I wanted to know, like, what qualifications do you need to have to qualify for one of your trials? Oh, good question. Um, these trials deal with different stages of breast cancer. So we look at stage. Uh, we look at the type of cancer. Uh, there, are, you know, people ask me, how can you do just breast cancer only? And I tell them, breast cancer is a thousand diseases in one. So it's meet, there's pretty strict criteria in each one of those trials. Breast cancer, sometimes you know, it's related to stage, the characteristics of the cancer, how aggressive the cancer is, 
does it contain certain genes within the cancer cell that we're trying to go after? <clears throat> Well, clinical trials, the nice thing about clinical trials is most of the, the cost of the clinical trials paid by the drug company, uh, so there's none. Also, the drug companies all uh, have a fund to help pay for transportation to our office, so you're running into problems with transportation, there's funding for transportation. So, you know, everybody thinks, well, how can I go on a trial? And the best part about it is that you don't have to go to Stanford or UCSF because our Women's Cancer Research Network is in conjunction with Stanford Research. So the same clinical trials that we have, some Stanford doesn't even have and vice versa, but that we're co-partnering Stanford and Women's Research Network. Yes? Do you have to tell me where I can get a shirt? Oh, <laughs> I'll give you the website. Okay, perfect. Um, so you said five days after your cycle, you should do the self-exam. Correct. And then also, could you speak to why your breasts are tender before your cycle and, um, and why we need to check at five days Five after? days, perfect. So, you know, as you know, the ovaries control the estrogen production in your body. So right before your periods, you have this huge estrogen surge. And that's why your breasts are more tender right before your periods, because the estrogen is stimulating the normal breast tissue of the breast. So at that time, the ducts are a little en engorged, the blood vessels are a little engorged, and so waiting five days afterwards is after that estrogen surge, so your breasts are not as tender and not quite, not inflamed, but, but enlarged, compared to you know, before your, your surge. Okay, thank you. A good question. My friend had uh, breast cancer, and she spoke on the dense, um, the dense scar tissue that you have, that people have, and that the, the machines that most hospitals use or your doctor's offices have, they don't use the specific machine that goes through that tissue. Um, how, how, why is it that it has, don't everybody already carry that machine that would already go through that dense tissue? Really, 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 really good question. So there's two aspects to that question. Number one, you're right. After a lumpectomy, after radiation therapy, the breast tissue is more dense. Sometimes it can be even develop edema or swelling. Uh, there are two facilities in this community that do lymphedema reduction. And so they get into massage therapy, they'll get them with a compression bra to decrease that swelling. The second answer to that question is, you're absolutely right. Outlying areas of, of Fresno do not have the best mammographic facilities. And when you go for your mammogram, you don't wanna to go to some podunk radiology place <laughs> because you just says, you know, I only see breast cancer. So when you only do one thing, you get really, really good at it. Yeah. And if you go to a mammography center, any of the hospitals, St. Agnes, Community Hospital, WISH, Women's Imaging, Advanced Medical Imaging, that's all they do. And with that, and so that's the answer, the second half of the, the answer, is go to a facility in a bigger town that is known just for mammography. We normally don't do that. We usually wait because you know chemotherapy suppresses the white blood cell count, and you don't want to have a low white count when you're going into surgery because you need to fight infection. So you we usually wait anywhere from depending on the type of chemotherapy, two to four weeks after the last chemotherapy to do surgery. Um, quick question: I am currently in treatment for stage four breast cancer, metastatic breast cancer. At what point would I consider um, trials if this seems to be working? I think at any time during the, during the continuum of your therapy. Uh, we have clinical trials that are in second line, third line. So I think whenever a patient presents with stage four disease, we talk about the standard of care, but we also say you're eligible for this trial. 
So anytime during that continuum, the patient should be talked to about the availability of clinical trials. So anytime. And the, the reason for that is not only because you might be eligible for a trial, but it also educates you to what's out there. There's nothing worse than having stage four disease and saying, oh my God, what's next? You know, having an option to knowing what's next really is a relief. And so, again, uh, education is power. And, you know, you, the, the, when you develop a disease or any time in life, you want to be powerful by knowledge. So. Let's see if she has a, as beautiful a voice talking as she does singing. <laughs> Hi, um, thank you for all the um, awesome information. I wanted to know, other than um, like checking for a lump or getting, you know, getting checked by the machine, is there any other signs that you um, that one has said that they've had? To that, um, also for people under 40, young ladies under 40, um, is are there signs? Because I have heard. You, what you guys Google? Good, great <laughs> questions. Uh, you must have. Um, yeah. So a couple things. Um, not all breast cancers are palpable. Uh, sometimes you can have inflammatory breast cancer, and that is redness of the breast almost looks like an infection. If some of you have had mastitis when you're nursing your kids, it looks like that. Also, any skin changes over the breast that look different. Any contour changes, you know, you've had breasts here and now this breast is pulled up here, uh, or nipple discharge. So those are the other non-palpable, non-mammographic things that you should check for. Yes? Grades, absolutely. So we talked about stage. Stage one is located to the breast. You know, stage four is where it's metastasized. Grade is what it looks like under the microscope. How aggressive is it? Grade one is slow growing, usually doesn't metastasize. Grade two is a little bit more aggressive. And grade three is the most aggressive. And that's why I brought up that, you know, African American population can present with more grade three cancers. Not so much, and also advanced stages for the reasons that we talked about. But th that's how, when the pathologist looks at the cancer under the microscope, he'll send us back a report saying, well, this is grade one. We don't get too pumped up over that. It's a curable, it's, you know, it's manageable, usually with hormone blocker therapy, not chemotherapy. Grade two, 70% of breast cancers are grade two, where it's not so super slow growing, nor is it super fast growing. And grade three is the fastest growing. Good. Again, great question. Hi, Dr. Perkins. Mine related to what uh, was asked earlier regarding the scarring, and because uh, women of color also develop keloids, and the keloids can can be painful, or they they can be itching, or so are there are there ways to are there specific uh, organizations or doctors that would work with someone that had keloids because of the surgery? I usually refer the keloids back to the plastic surgeon because there's some things that the plastic surgeon can do. He can obviously pray and hope that if he takes out that keloid that it doesn't reform again. Uh, they can inject it with steroids, which helps. Um, we've done low-dose radiation therapy along keloid formation, not a great idea. I've maybe done it once or twice in the 200 years I've been doing this. Um, but most of the time I send them back to the surgeon to have a re-excision of the keloid. But a lot of times we don't like touching it because some, even with the re-excision it can make it even worse. So it's a tough, it doesn't happen often, you know, but you know, once enough. question is in regards to the dense breast tissue. For the women that may, you know, get the mammogram and have the dense breast tissue, they are advised to have conversations with their primary care physician. Aside from doing the mammogram, what things should they do or look for um, yearly with those treatments? 
Um, so in the 19, early 1980s, there was legislation passed in California that the, every mammogram had to mention density. And the reason for that, some of it was politically driven for whatever reason, and some of it was scientifically driven because we know that dense breast tissue, uh, for some reason, the supportive structures of the breast tissue itself, there's a slight increased incidence of developing cancer in dense breasts. Um, all, that's why we don't start mammograms before 40, because the dense, the, when you're below 40, your breast, your breast tissue is very, very dense. So as you get older, you develop more fat in the breast, which kind of dilutes the density. In answer to your question, there's nothing else that we usually recommend um, other than good breast exam, monthly cell breast exam, and making sure that you stay on top of your yearly mammograms. You know, MRIs, you know, if you're at high risk of developing breast cancer, for example, say your mom had breast cancer or you're BRCA positive, we follow those patients by MRI or if the patient's BRCA positive but doesn't want to have a mastectomy, to randomly do ultrasounds, we don't recommend that. No questions from the guys? <laughs> they didn't go to Dr. Google before they came in today to ask her questions. Yes? My question is, what if you have family members on both sides, women, uh, sisters, aunties, that have had breast cancer. And uh, every time maybe I go, they say, well, you have a small chance or there's a little lump, but don't worry about it. But I tell them, well, it runs in my family on both sides. So you asked two questions. One is, it, what happens if you have a, a ton of family members with breast cancer? Somebody in there should have been BRCA tested or genetically tested. <coughs> Genetic testing, oh, seven years ago, was $5,000. It was such a ripoff. There was only one company doing it. Then, you know, thank God for capitalism, and a bunch of people come in and start competing, and now you can be BRCA tested for $350 almost what it costs you to fill up your tank of gas these days. <laughs> so if you're curious, get tested. You can go to your primary care, your gynecologist, and say, you know, send off the request to Quest, I want to be bracket tested. So, you know, it's, it's, I think it's really important because, you know, especially I think more so in the Latin American population, they don't like to talk about their health. You know, they shove it under the carpet again because, you know, it's the, the family and the kids and the parents and everybody else that they have to take care of. So, you know, just uh, ask if you want to be bracket tested. You know, they've recommended now that everybody with breast cancer be bracket tested. I think it's a, a little bit of an overreach, unless there, you know, unless there's family history to indicate that you should, or they're under the age of 40. Um, and the other question you brought up: What happens if you present with a little lump? And again, it gets back to what I said earlier. If you present with a little lump and they do a mammogram and you know that it's new, this is a new thing. You go get your mammogram, they pat you on the back and tell you it's okay. You go back to your primary care physician and said, oh, your mammogram is fine. And unfortunately, most days now, primary cares don't examine patients, which drives me crazy. And he pats you, he or she pats you on the back, you need to see another physician. Because if you find a new lump, it needs the only way, nobody can put their fingers on a lump and say, oh, this is not cancer. May, but us humans cannot do that. The only way you can diagnose cancer is to get tissue, put it under the microscope, and have the pathologist tell you it's benign or, or not. You can't do it with your fingers. Mammogram can say, yeah, this looks suspicious, needs to be biopsy, but you know it's up to the pathologist to tell you whether it's cancer or not, not a physician's finger. Medipore put in? How is ah, it? Great question. So, patients that require chemotherapy, uh, there's a device that uh, the Department of Radiology, the, some surgeons still put them in, surgeons in outlying areas, but the surgeons here in town, for the most part, are not doing it. So, the Department of Radiology makes a small incision, puts this device in underneath the skin, 
so we can you know, put a needle through the skin into this device to draw blood and give chemotherapy. Uh, you can swim with it, bathe with it, travel with it. You, you, you barely see it, it's almost like a little bubble underneath the skin. But a great idea, I mean, we do a lot of ports because we're not into torturing our nurses or the patient by you know, multiple sticks and you know, a lot of patients have bad veins. Yes. Okay, I heard you say once a year for uh, exam. My doctor told me every um, two years, so I wasn't quite sure on that. But I've been getting them every year. But then um, he said, you don't have to come back like to the next year. So which one? Yeah, mammograms after the age of 40 need to be done yearly. Okay. Period. Stick to no one. debate. <laughs> yep, I figured it too. Yeah. And I have one, one more question. Um, does implants, does that cause uh, breast cancer? No. So let's talk about implants. Good segue. Um, breast, uh, implants do not cause breast cancer. There's some older implants called textured implants that there might be a slight increase in incidence of lymphoma. I maybe have seen one case that was attributed to the textured implants. The problem with implants is that if you have an A cup and you turn it into Dolly Parton with the implants, <laughs> it compresses the breast tissue. So instead of having this much of a round of breast tissue, it compresses the breast tissue to like paper thin. So it's harder to pick up cancers mammographically, a little bit more difficult. Again, if you go to a mammographic center, what they'll do is displace the implant, they'll push the implant to one side, which brings up the breast tissue where they can do a mammogram. But if you don't go to a facility that doesn't do the implant displacement, um, it does, uh, you know, it, it is harder. So, yes. Wow, a male asking a question. Fantastic. Good morning. Good morning, Doc. Good morning. Uh, question. How likely is it for a man to have breast cancer? Oh, man. You guys, you did go to Dr. Google before today. <laughs> I love it. So, I have presently two males in my practice with breast cancer, and like I said, I've been doing this for 200 plus years, and I've probably had, oh, uh, no, seriously, I've been a breast cancer specialist for 30 years, and I've probably had less than 10 males develop breast cancer, and it's usually a strong family history, like a mom had breast cancer. Uh, a lot of the males have, are positive for the BRCA gene, but the same thing holds true. You know, you're not gonna get mammograms. You males are not gonna get mammograms, but if you feel a lump, and you know, a lot of, as you get older, you'll get, as we refer to as gynecomastia, or you know, bigger boobs, uh, males. But if there's a lump that you feel, it needs to get worked up. Just like in women. If there's a new lump, and you say, okay, this wasn't there last month, it needs to get worked up. And it needs to get biopsied. Sure, they'll put you through a mammogram, and that hurts. You know, you don't have any breast tissue. And you know, women complain about mammograms because they squeeze and are painful. Well, on male, it's even more painful, but you know, mammogram needs to get done, and then a biopsy. I got one more question. Guys. Excellent. What about, uh, we do outreach ministry, what about the ladies that are homeless and can't get to a facility? Ooh. What do you suggest for someone? And you touch on a subject that's near and dear to my heart. You know, I can't believe in a country that we live in, and I shouldn't go off on this tangent, but I will. <laughs> you know, we see a dog on the side of the road that has a broken leg, and we pick up that dog, we take it to the SPCA, they mend the leg, put the dog up for adoption, the dog lives happily ever after. But in our country now, we drive by homeless people and we go like this. That's gotta stop. And that's why this shirt is so important that love changes everything. Um, there are certain programs that the homeless women can apply for. Mike, Michael, do you have it, no. it, it would be through community, through the indigent program. Yeah, probably a community hospital. A community hospital has an indigent program. Um, that's a really good question. And you know what? I'll look into that and give the pastor a call and give you the answer. 
I'm embarrassed to say I don't know. I mean, in our office, we don't refuse care to anybody, unless, you know, they don't treat my staff nice. <laughs> but, you know, so for us, I, I've never had to put my head in that space, but I'll look into it. Yeah. So, yes. Um, leading with that, um, I know you talked about, um, thank you. Leading with that, I know you talked about like um, eating, you know, healthier foods because we, you know, we like, you know, our mm -hmm. butter and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> but um, that's okay. <laughs> but in moderation. But um, what if, uh, what are some quick options or access um, for those who don't have the option of getting like healthier foods, like um, you know, fruits and veggies. I know that there's programs for like women with children, but other, you know, cause going to the drive-through to get, you know, nothing's really cheap that more, but <laughs> to grab something is an easier option than trying to buy a meal for some people. So do you have any resources or um, something that maybe could provide later on where to get healthier foods or um, diets that you should go towards to avoid the, the fatty foods? Yeah, again, you guys are stumping me with these last two questions. Um, you know, I could probably through the food bank, you might be able to touch base with them to see if the food bank has healthy eating options. It's all about, re, you know, I love butter. Yeah. I, like I mean, butter, <laughs> it's like, yeah. to exist without, yes, Mike. Melissa has classes with ICS. Okay. I, ICS? I, yes. It's they, they refer for like TPN and whatnot. So there's like a nutritionist nurse that we have that can come and do educational things. Uh, so we could set that up. That's a really good question. Why don't we talk about um, setting up a nutritionist? Call me Laura. <laughs> yeah, where is Laura? <laughs> anyway, we could have a nutritionist come and talk to you. But it, all it is, I mean, like I said, you know, we went out of town this weekend and we were packing up food to go and I was like, where's the butter? You know, and, but it, it, and it, it's all about, you know, I do the Monday morning thing. Get out of the shower Monday morning, I look at myself and say, man, Perkins, you gotta shut your mouth this week. And you know, setting goals for yourself, and it can't be lofty goals. It can't be like, oh, I'm gonna lose 20 pounds this week. It has to be where they're consistent. So every Monday morning, you weigh yourself and you say, you know, I want to set a goal of losing a pound a week. And if you don't, then it means that you're not exercising enough or still taking too much calories in. And calories, you know, they're calorie dense foods like butter, cream, uh, you know, fast food is calorie, intensely calorie dense. And you're absolutely right. I mean, you can cook a meal at home almost cheaper than you can to go to a fast food place. And all it takes is that shift. And you think, you know, I'm gonna put olive oil in my vegetables today instead of butter. You think, oh, no way. But, you know, do that, setting goals for yourself. You know, that Monday morning goal of saying, you know, this is where I wanna be. And it's, it's a tough, like I said, you know, I'll give women chemotherapy to reduce their breast cancer by risk or 4%. And, you know, they'll come back weighing, you know, 20 pounds the next visit and they could reduce it by 23%. It's just that mindset, and it's really hard to break. Because, you know, our parents cook this way, our yeah. grandparents, you know, who doesn't love going to their grandparents' house and eating? But you know you're gonna be gaining five pounds <laughs> by going to your grandmother's house. But it, and it's also, more importantly, where's, that, where's your beautiful daughter? You know, it's not for us. It's for our kids that we have to do it. You know, the, there's a rapid explosion of obesity in the United States right now. Rapid explosion. Part of it you can blame on COVID, but I think part of it is you have to blame it on our own narcissism. Yeah. You know? I'm gonna do what I damn well please and eat whatever I want. <laughs> you know, that's gotta stop. Yeah, it's true. You know, and it's just that, you know, but it's comfort food. For example, when I'm at work and stressed out and doing what I do, I stress eat. I wish I was the other way around. But you know, we get into those modes where something isn't going right in our lives and we eat. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. We're going off, go off topic there, but. <laughs> but that was good. That was good. Well, it's hard. Habits are hard to break. And food is a difficult habit because there's so much. I mean, I can't believe it. 
You go to the grocery store and there's a whole aisle of potato chips. Nowhere else in the world is there a whole aisle of potato chips. No. All right, we'll take one more question and then we'll have to cut this off. So my question is, for a person who is under 40 but has a family history of breast cancer, do you actually recommend them to start getting their screenings before the age of 40? Uh, good question. Um, I think it depends on a couple factors. Were those cancers genetically related? Did one of those family members have the BRCA gene? If they did, so let's talk, I'm gonna deviate a little bit and I'll come back and answer that question. So if your mom had is BRCA positive, then the child, you know, I always get this question, you know, my kid's six years old, when should I, and I'm BRCA positive, when should I have her bracket tested? You know, not at six, not at 12, not at 14, probably at 25, um, because you don't want to create this paranoia. Uh, in, you know, kids have a paranoia. You don't want to create any more. So, and um, so starting, so if the family member, so you should know before the age of 40 if you're bracket positive. If you're not BRCA positive, and there are other genes that we test for now too, also. We just don't check for BRCA. There's a myriad of other genes that we're testing, and most of these uh, BRCA panels include those other genes. So uh, if you're BRCA negative, family history, still probably do it at 40. So in the back is my partner, Dr. G. She joined the practice two years ago. Um, she's Phenomenal, best partner I've ever had. And, and I haven't had that many because I've been in solo practice for many years because as my nurses would tell me, nobody can play in the sandbox with me because I have like expectations that are <laughs> a little probably more than I should. But anyway, she's great. And it, you know, some women just don't want to see a male physician. So we have female physician in the practice. Uh, we'll be adding another physician shortly. and be another female, so that's always good. Thank you very much. Honored to be here. And Wasn't that amazing? Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Perkins. May God bless you. May his face shine upon you. Amen. And Dr. G, I did invite her to come up front, but she said she don't want to sit down. <laughs> so that was a blessing. So, um, wow. First Lady, are you ready to give the message today? Amen. What a blessing. We're going to have our very own First Lady to bring a short message today. Amen. Thank you. I just thank God for Dr. Perkins. You know, he already laid out the message. It was laid out to you, ladies. But we need to put some action to it. We need to believe what he said. He did the study. Amen. He took care of the patients. We got to follow what he just said. Amen. I was just thinking about, you know, what he said, that how women, you know, take care of everybody. And we think about back in the garden when God made Adam. And he looked around, I need somebody else. <laughs> and what did he make? A woman. A woman that had everything that the man needs. Yes. He was gonna, she was going to create for him. Come on. She was going to stand by his side. She was going to tell him. Honey, you need, to, you need to go to God about that. And then you turn around to God and say, God, you really need to talk to your son. Yes. <laughs> because I'm trying to tell him, but his image, he won't listen to me. And so when we think about the woman, you, if you don't take care of yourself, yeah. you can't help that man out. You won't even have the strength to go to God and say, you really need to talk to your son. <laughs> And so I just thank God for that message. I was, as he was talking, I began to get teary-eyed and think about 
You know, Dr. Perkins, I lost my mother three weeks ago. She had heart disease. She gave birth to 11 children, but not only 11 children, she was the community's mother. Everybody in here that knowed her, she had a kind word to say to everybody and encouraged everyone. She took care of everybody, but the person that took care of everybody didn't take care of herself. Yeah. I had to step in when she was saying she was tired. And I said, Mama, you took care of us, now I'm gonna take care of you. I'm taking you to the doctor. But, you know, maybe God had a call for her to come home. But I knew I did everything, I thought I did everything to take her to the doctor, to take care of this lady. Sometime it's too late. God is a great physician and he sent the physicians. Yeah. We need to begin to listen to the physician. Wow. We need to be, take care of self-care yeah. and not feel guilty when things aren't going right. Take care of yourself. You can't help a drowning woman or man if you're drowning yourself. Wow. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm going to get to the word and get a little sensitive, but... I'm with this to take care of self more. In the Bible, in Mark 5 and 27, 33 says, and when she heard Jesus, she came and pressed behind him and touched his garment. You all know that woman that had an issue of blood, that had problems going in her body. She was going to physician. She had spent her all and she still could not get healed because they weren't sending her to the right place. They were taking her money. They weren't helping her. Yeah. But when she heard about the great physician, yes. you had a physician here, ladies. You heard a physician talking to you about your help. Are you going to listen? Are you going to go? Amen. He, after this, he might not, you all going to tell your friends about him. He might have to get a bigger office because you're going to listen and tell your friends about him. Yeah. Before, so she said, if I can touch but the hem of his garment, because I did everything else. I gave all my money. I worked hard. I took care of my family. I'm at living. I worked hard, I took care of my family, I did all I can, but I'm still believing. I need some help. So she heard about the great physician, yes. hallelujah, yes. and she said, if I can touch by the hem of his garment, but she had to have faith, she had to do something. Ladies, we've got to do something. Right. Stop all the talking if you're not gonna do something. Amen. Yes. We got to do something. Yeah. Hallelujah. And so when she went and she touched his garment, yeah, go and go to your doctor. Yes. And when you go to your doctor, like she went and touched his garment, she was whole. Yeah. Hallelujah. The Bible said there's a time and a season for everything in Ecclesiastes. There's a time to wake up. There's a time to be born, yeah. and there's a time to go to glory. But sometimes we're rushing our time to glory because you're not listening. That's yes. Good. yes. We must begin to listen to what the physicians are telling us, what the nutrition are telling us. We got to be able to meditate, fast, and pray, and stop. I know what I've been doing this week, and I talked to my doctor eating comfort food because I'm thinking that's comforting me. But pounds are flying on me and that's not good. Yes. Don't hurt yourself yeah. because you're feeling down. You still got to take care of your body. Yes. But when she heard, let's get back to the, when she touched the great physician, he said, who touched me? And he knew his, it was thrown before him, that plague, that blood that cancer, whatever you're going through, if you go to the great physician and go to the physician, you are going to be healed. And sometimes sometime the healing just not will not come that way. 
but healing can be knowledge to your family. Yes. Healing can be a witness that I have faith and I took care of my body and my daughters and my sons will see that I've taken care of my body. I listened. Yeah. And I saved my generation. I changed my generation by eating all that butter on my biscuit and eating that gravy that causes heart disease. Yes. We've got to listen. Yes. When you want to go to the 7-Eleven and get that big sugar Slurpee, is it good for you? I know it comforts you and it's cold, but is it good for you? It's not good for you. Hallelujah. Starbucks. I'm not talking against them, but they're making money off of you, but most of all, they're taking you too early. Hallelujah. Now let me close it up because he, he gave it. But I'm just back. I'm, I'm doing a sister thing. I'm doing a sister thing. You know how the sisters talk to one. I'm doing a sister thing. But when she heard Jesus, she had faith. Do you have faith? Yes. That your situation can be changed? Yes. Do you have faith? Yes. That your generation can be changed? Yes. Do you have faith? That you're gonna change your diet? Yes. You're gonna exercise? Yes. Even though you might have some issues right now in your body, but that can be changed. I, I, I was reading how the body can heal itself if we check it at the right time. That's good. Yeah. It can heal itself. That's how God, God has never made nothing imperfect. We have made it imperfect, like the doctor said. Amen. So when she touched the hem of her garment, she had faith, but still she knew she had to do something and there had to be a change. We have to reach out in faith. We have to touch God with our prayers and our meditation, yes. believe in the higher being. Yes. I don't believe in evolution. Nothing can make me but God. Amen. Because he knew what I was going to go through. He knew Amen. I was going to be. So he had to stop me and say, daughter, listen. Nobody, I, nobody else can do that. It, my husband loved me, but he can't do that. Amen. Amen. Only God, the great physician. Amen. Praise God. So we have to reach out by faith. We have to believe God. Amen. And I want to leave with you, Mark. Five and 35, and he said unto the daughter, thy faith has made thee whole. Yes. Now go in peace. Yes. Behold, thy plague has made thee whole. God healed her. Yes. Go in peace. God has wholeness for each one of you in every area of your life. The depression, oppression, whatever you're going through, God can bring you through it, through the loss. I know God has been comforting me, these human emotions I've had, because my mother will always be with me. I won't see her again till glory. Yeah. But I'm going to do better. I'm going to do better. I'm going to remember when my body starts talking to me. You got to remember when your body's talking to you to listen to it. Yes. Amen. Amen. I want to leave with you all today. Go your way. Be healed. I thank God again for the staff that has came. Thank you for taking time out of your day. Thank you for the humble doctor and that. Thank God for each and every one of you. And I want to leave with you. We must pray for one another. Yes. Encourage one another. Yes. Pray for the sick. Yes. Have a heart and compassion for the homeless. Amen. Yes. Amen. And as I leave, I just want to congratulate my granddaughter, Tatiana Howe. She was, she was Miss Black Fresno on yesterday. We are so proud. I just thank God for that. You all be blessed. Have a blessed day. And thank you for all of your prayers that you are praying for us. 
our family, and we have another family that lost their mother. Can you stand up, sweetheart? Uh, one of you young ladies. Uh, pray for the family. Reach back and pray for that family. Pray for those daughters. Hallelujah. Father God, Lord, you go forth and Lord, you touch them, Lord. Comfort them. Heal them only as you can, Lord. Be with them, Lord. Let them remember what their mother has imparted to them, that they will go forth and believe this will make them stronger. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Now shake someone's hand. Well, no, give them a fist bump at my no, no, no. home. Amen. I am sorry, all standing. No, 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 no. Give it to you, Thank you. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Amen. Wasn't that a powerful word? Real quick, sister, support. Amen. Real quick, um, we are praying for you, Denise, Denisha, and Destiny where we're gonna lift you guys up. They recently lost her mother. We're still praying for you, Ramonda, and your family. So let's continue to keep them in prayer. But if you're here today, and you've never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, we, we can't leave today without giving you an opportunity, opportunity to make him your, the Lord of your life. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're here today and you feel the tell on your heart that you do need to Make a decision to make Jesus the Lord of your life. Just raise your hand in the air. I love to pray with you and for you today. I see that hand. Hallelujah. Or you may have once walked with the Lord, but you turned away and you want to rededicate your life to him. If that's you today, just raise your hand in the air. I love to pray with you today. I see that hand. Hallelujah. Or you may have... Um, you're looking for a church home, a place where you can fellowship and receive the word of God. If that's you, raise your hand in the air. i love to pray with you today. Now, I gave three calls, a call for salvation, a call for rededication, and a call to partner with Mount Zion. If you didn't raise your hand, but you, you feel like you should have, it's not too late. Just raise your hand in the air. We'd love to pray with you today. Amen. Now I saw two hands, those with their hands raised. If you could just meet me here at the altar. Come on everyone, let's give them a hand clap. Those ladies that raised their hands, just, just meet me here at the altar. I'd love to pray a quick prayer with you. Come on, you guys can do better than that. I know the angels in heaven are rejoicing. Hallelujah. You can just look at me. So the Bible says when you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised Christ from the dead, you'll be saved. So we're going to say a quick prayer and then we have some information we'd love to give you. Amen? So just repeat after me. Lord Jesus, I believe that you died on the cross for my sins. I ask you now that you forgive me of all my sins. And I receive you now as my Lord and my Savior. Amen. Hallelujah. It's just that simple. Uh, we have personal care workers right behind you. They're going to just take you in the room real briefly to give you some information about us. Amen. Praise the Lord. God bless you. Amen. Let's give the Lord another hand clap. And we prepare. Amen. Uh, God bless Dr. Perkins and staff and the other doctors and just everyone. Uh, we're so happy to that you came and shared with us again. My wife has already said that on this Women's Day. I Just real quick, I, I want to again remind you to keep these bereaved families uh, in prayer, amen, the daughters that are back there, and the, our family, wife's family, and uh, praise the Lord, the sister that lost her husband, amen, as well. We thank God, and I'm praying for you. Yeah. Uh, I want to give you a bit of information real quick. The homegoing service, for Mother Quarles uh, will be this coming Friday at 10 a.m. at West uh, West Side Adventist Church, amen, at 10 a.m. this coming Friday. And so uh, the auxiliaries, the bereavement department, someone will be contacting all of you, some of you that would like to donate or have uh, for the bereavement, uh, for the repast, right? Amen? How y'all doing? Yeah. Everybody okay? I know it's a little difficult, amen, it is for me as well. And so we just thank God. Uh, seems like there was something else I wanted to uh, announce, but 
he escapes me right now. Nobody? Nobody? No, no clues? Okay. Amen. I know what it was. What did you say? I'm sorry for keeping you standing so long, but the class? Oh, yeah. Well, they did great. They enjoyed the class yesterday. The class is uh, 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 the martial arts, whatever it was. We were having a good time. Self-defense. I know what it was. Listen, and you know what? I just want to thank my wife uh, again because uh, this past Friday, we celebrated 45-year wedding anniversary. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Want to mention that? Amen. Thank you. Thank you for putting up with me. Amen. All right. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your grace and your mercy. We pray your manifold blessing upon all this thy people. They are a great people. We praise you for all things. Bless us as we depart from this place, but never ever from your presence. We thank God. Bless the uh, ministries. Bless the physicians. Bless the health course, health care system. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. God bless you. Thank you. Shake somebody's hand, wave them, do 